1960s very successfully. We're going to have to build successful defense campaigns to get the heat off of our activists and win over the support of the broad public for what we are trying to do. And bottom line, bottom line, uh, Occupy the Hood for, for many months, as you know, has been emphasizing, number one, that we have to become a community-based movement. And number two, we need to become a movement of organizers. It is not enough for us to congregate here together with each other. We are already the conscious minority. We've got to go after organizing the broad base of that 99%. That is the only thing that will make our politics and our movement effective and successful. And it is also the only way that we can defend this movement against the repressions that I see coming down right now. Because there's a lot of funny politics, just like what our state attorney general pulled uh, a week and a half ago after six months of claiming that she wasn't going to sign on to this bogus federal agreement with the bank to settle uh, uh, with the banks about any criminal liability uh, for what they've been doing with people's homes. She sold the homeowners in this state out basically and flip-flopped on them just like that. We saw the same thing here at City Hall uh, with the mayor and the city council. More of that stuff's going to be coming down the pike as the struggle heats up. The homeowners are stepping up. Folks on, on Skid Row are stepping up to fight for their human rights. Other groups are standing up now, and that's going to start converging with what we're doing. We need to make sure that we're converging with that motion also. So um, thanks to everybody uh, for, for coming out uh, to, to, uh, to this GA. I appreciate the fact uh, that occupiers are trying to raise their own level of understanding of a lot of different struggles that you have, may not have been directly a part of. This is absolutely essential for us to build a serious movement that can change things. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I want to make a lot of people, most of us, come out of uh, the black radical, what we call the black radical uh, tradition. I self-identify myself as a new African revolutionary nationalist. And it's made clear to a lot of people, during the 60s and 70s, and the heat of our struggles, we weren't out there getting shot down by the pig, being jailed, being repressed, being investigated, being exiled, being ran out of the country, just so our, our end goal was to elect some black president. I want you to understand that, all right? That ain't what we were fighting for. We weren't trying to replace one person because they happen to have a darker tan than another person who was still with the goddamn program that we're fighting. So I want people to be clear about that. Our goal was not to elect some black dude for president. We're a little more deeper than that. We used to call that re reactionary nationalism. Reactionary nationalism. So we, I want to be clear with that. Uh, we want to open it up for discussion. Any questions from any of the speakers? Questions? Where was Esteban? Esteban, Esteban. In the 60s, I was in the National Committee Combat Fashion, which is a defense group for the Panthers. And we had a lot of supporters. My question is, why does not today the Black Riders have that kind of outreach and support? You know, after all the changes and all the awareness supposedly, and all so much sensitivity, why are the Riders still not getting much white support? But right now, um, it's kind of hard reaching the people. It's kind of hard reaching. When we set out, we go out there and we look for support. But it's up to uh, um, it's up to the people to come in. When we send out, right now we got a part called Black Rider Friends. We got a part called Elders for Black Riders. It's for the elder people to come down. We have many things open, but we just got to grab the people. It's the people that got to come to the day, come to the meetings, or even support a show. We got websites, we got numbers. It's up to the people now. It's up to you to decide that. Yeah. <laughs> but all, also, I mean, think, think about the consciousness in Occupy when we first got started. Right. A lot of people in Occupy didn't even know that there or recognize that there were issues with the police. Because in their community, there never was an issue. All right, now the, the black riders come out of a totally different environmental situation where police brutality is an everyday reality. Shooting, beating, illegal 
Okay. Uh, search and seizure, all this stuff that goes on constantly. Now, a lot of people in Occupy now are much more open to these questions than they were uh, four or five months ago because their own experience has taught them something about how the police operate on a broad scale and the fact that they're not always great respecters of people's human rights. Okay, but that was a process. I mean, a lot of us came in, into Occupy knowing that, but others of us, many of us, did not know that. Now, when you look at that being the kind of gap between people who are actually politically conscious as versus the population as a whole, that begins to outline how big the problem is. And that is part of, of the problem. I think that, that was what Michael was talking about when he talked about the fact that a lot of people who came out of the, the 60s on the white left in particular, stepped back from a lot of these struggles. They kind of got frustrated with trying to struggle to change things and kind of, you know, settled with the system. And so uh, uh, some of that linkage where you had conscious people who were doing that kind of work, Michael does this work all the time, okay? But he's one individual. I mean, and there are others who I know, okay, in this town and around the country who likewise do serious anti-racist work, but it's, it is not a large enough group. We need groups like the Occupy Movement to be conscious and to yeah. spread that consciousness, and that will solve the problem. Yeah. <laughs> Can I say two, two quick answers to that? Uh, you did mention they have what's called Friends of the Black Riders, and I would invite people to get involved with that, which would be material aid and defense work. The other thing is that the Jericho Amnesty Movement is an international formation. There are uh, European, Puerto Rican, uh, uh, Muslim, uh, Arab, uh, Native American, all kinds of people in that organization to free all political prisoners. And, you know, you're welcome to join the LA chapter at any time you'd <laughs> like you to. Tell so. us what that website is that people can contact. Uh, um, website is www.blackrodersliberation and it's on YouTube. Black Riders Liberation on YouTube. I was just going to make a suggestion that I I will get all this information from Michael later and then put it up on the Los Angeles GA website and get it to media people so that everybody can get it. Does that sound good? Yeah. Question. Yeah. 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 Um, not really a question. I was just hoping that uh, you touched upon it earlier. You touched upon it earlier about Marcus Garvey and the history of the UNIA and uh, what that had, um, in a, or what effect that had on, on this movement as a whole. Um, Historically, when African prisoners of war were brought to the United States, there was a history of resistance, organized resistance. They used terms like slave rebellion, maroon uprising. I gave an example how Africans sided with the British against the U.S. settler colonials because they offered freedom. And in the 1914s, uh, a, 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 a Jamaican brother uh, named Marcus Messiah Garvey, answered Che Guevara, started traveling throughout the Central and South America and came to New York and was shocked at the conditions he observed of African people throughout the Central and South America and the States. No different than Che Guevara for the famous motorcycle journey. And he came back and realized that, in fact, this crisis can only be addressed by organization. Now, before Marcus Messiah Garvey, there were serious organizations that had a historical legacy. But he began organizing Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, which had chapters all over Africa, the Caribbean, Central and South America, and in Europe. In fact, in Costa Rica, when I was there, they have an active chapter there. There's an active chapter in Los Angeles. It was a mass movement. They had a registered nurse corps. They had a motor corps. They had manufacturing. They had shipping. And their objective was, number one, the question of Africans setting up and repatriating back to Mother Africa because the view was the fact that you could not gain liberation in the European settler colony because we're a national minority. Okay? If you look at the leadership within the Nation of Islam, if you look at the leadership at most major organizations today, they were heavily influenced by the UNIA and African Communities League. The notion of black dolls, black power, black is beautiful, black whatever came out of that movement. Okay? I can go in more detail, but I'm sure there's other questions. But bottom line is that when you hear groups say they're Afrocentric or Pan-Africanist or Kwanzaa or whatever, 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 that's a building on that tradition, which basically argues that once we were brought from Mother Africa to here, our cultural, historical, and nationalistic or anti-imperialist legacy continued on. It takes many forms. In the Black Panther Party, 
it was a Marxist overlay, but fundamentally the Black Panther Party was about revolutionary black nationalism, and certain wings like New York, LA moved into the Pan-African direction, others moved other ways, anarchism and so forth. But it's always that trend. Now I'm not saying that's the only trend in our community, because we got the Democratic Party trend, we got a black Marxist trend, we got a black nationalist trend, we got a black integrationist trend. We have many different trends. But that is a dynamic movement that fundamentally is anti-imperialist and fighting to keep the United States from the reconquest, the recolonization of Africa, which you see in Uganda, which you see in Somalia, with the, with the uh, de demonification of Mugabe in Zimbabwe, same in Sudan, uh, they were victorious in Cote d'Ivoire with the motherfucking French invading and killing our youth, uh, and of course in Tripoli, Libya, you know, which was the most advanced, the highest quality of life by all UNESCO social indicators in Libya, the highest, yet they attacked their government. And today, just in Benghazi alone, there's over 250 militias, which are just a gangbanging going on in just one city, Benghazi, not in the whole of Libya. But anyway, I'll pass on that. I just, I just want to say in response to your question, uh, Marcus Garvey was attacked by J. Edgar Hoover. Yeah, the first and J. Edgar Hoover yeah. was the person well, there was other things. There was the Palmer raid, where they raided a lot of uh, communists also. But Marcus Garvey was one of the people who was attacked, and his movement was destroyed by J. Edgar Hoover. That was a model for the Quantel program in the 60s, where they assassinated King and Malcolm and, and Fred Hampton. Was that mail fraud thing? And, and, and one of the things I didn't talk about, uh, yeah. the other brother talked about, was uh, Geronimo. There was also another brother named Deruba, right. who was uh, 